Sometimes, as you know, Vanity Fair or the New York Times Magazine or one of those asks somebody to come up with her ideal dinner party. And nearly always, she will choose as one of the guests a born conversationalist with a kind of je ne sais quoi and savoir faire. And she'll usually also try to invite an artist who's been to the furthest corners of the earth and brought back some of the deepest and most inspiring images from there. And quite often, the respondent will choose a scientist who sits on the facts of life as they have been empirically proven. And every dinner party, of course, needs a wise man. So today, we thought we would give you the ideal dinner party, all in the form of Mathieu Ricard. All, <laughs> all four people. <laughs> um, most of you, I think, know that Mathieu was born in Paris and grew up the son of a celebrated abstract artist and one of France's leading uh, editor intellectuals. He got a PhD in cellular genetics at the Institut Pasteur under the Nobel Prize winning Francois Jacob. But in the meantime, in his early 20s, he went to India and Nepal, and he met various Tibetan teachers who seemed to sit on a sense of wisdom and peace and happiness that I think he hadn't met so often in Paris. And so he threw over his <laughs> promising career and decided to study with them. And he's been a monk for more than 40 years. He's been bringing the words of His Holiness the Dalai Lama into French for 25 years. And after about a quarter of a century of this, his father came to Nepal and essentially asked Mathieu why he had become a monk. And Mathieu essentially asked his father why he hadn't. <laughs> and <laughs> the transcription of their discussions, the monk and the philosopher, became a huge hit across the globe. And Mathieu then brought out a beautiful book on happiness, reminding us all that it's something that all of us have in our power, regardless of our religion or tradition or lack of same. He's brought out seven books of photography, including one, Motionless Journey, that to me is the most haunting investigation of changelessness and change and the relation of self to the world that I've ever encountered. And now, finally, in English, his great 850-page magnum <laughs> opus on altruism is with us this week. Uh, and in it, he uh, stitches together cutting-edge research from labs across the globe, a really deep command of the philosophies of East and West, uh, and extraordinary data on everything from climate change to homicide rates, as a way of showing us not only that altruism is how we make our own lives and the lives of people around us much better, but also how, through it, we can transform our relationship to animals, the environment, and the world. And as you all know, Matthew is in constant demand. He's at the World Economic Forum in Davos every year. He's constantly at TED. Uh, I last met him, in fact, in October at TED Global. So we're really lucky to have him here. I'm sorry to embarrass you with uh, all of that, Matthew. Uh, and I'll embarrass you further with a not very friendly question, which is all of us in this room know how important altruism is. What is it that we fail to understand or need to understand about it that we don't? Ah. Uh. I don't know. Thank you, first, people, for those kind words. Uh, I think it's not that we fail to understand, but maybe we don't take the full measure of uh, what I love to call the banality of goodness. <laughs> because, you see, uh, maybe it's not really our fault. Uh, it is natural that our attraction our attention is, uh, has to be uh, attracted specifically to something that is out of the norm, that could possibly threatening, mm -hmm. and that is uh, surprising, for which we need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. So if something is uh, going fine, look, uh, you know, I have not much to worry especially about being here sitting. Uh, and if, if all of you today have done some wonderful things, you know, you, some of you might have gone together to help the elderly or do something great for an NGO or just like relate in the decent way to each other, this is no news. Yeah. And it doesn't surprise us. You know, we won't at the, uh, when we finish and we go out, uh, I, I don't think anyone will say, nobody has started a fist fight. Such a relief, you know. <laughs> so, no, but if two people start a fist fight, you know, you, and 
two weeks, we say, you know, we went to this conference on altruism, and those guys start bashing each other. So then if you see 40,000 homicides, uh, when you, had, you have been 20 years old, you would have seen 20,000 violent dead on TV, on movie, uh, 20 years old. 10,000 when you are 12. What does that mean you know, about reality? So it is perhaps not a conscious bias, but it's maybe that we need to pay attention to what's dangerous, and we underestimate. And we often exaggerate the opposite. You know, the wicked world syndrome, everybody is bad, man, man is a wolf for man, or Freud, who comes with ideas that I have not thought much about human nature, but from, from what I know about human beings, they're all but rascals. Good start in life, you know. <laughs> you start with that, and then, okay. So this idea is sort of cast a shadow on the fact that yes, selfishness exists. I don't have to write a book to prove the existence of selfishness, you know, especially not 800 pages. But along that, <laughs> the possibility of altruism has been vastly underestimated, and the potential that we have within us. The fact that there's not a single social, social psychological study ever that comforted the ideology of universal selfishness. And you know, scratch at the surface on an altruist, and the selfish will bleed. You know, if you are very smart, you will find somewhere a really selfish motivation in the most seemingly most generous altruistic behavior. That ideology is just wrong, it's ideology, it's, and it's never been, it's armchair science, basically. Yeah. So that, I think, something that we need to take the measure of. It is seen, for instance, in natural catastrophe. You know, look at Katrina, there was this report, there's rape, there's a rampage, and then it was all over the news, the governor sent the army instead of sending you no know, help, because it was so dangerous. But then, in the end, all the newspapers apologized because they had been mutual help. There was the Robin Hood of the, the, a group that keeping on helping people. Few people went to the supermarket to get clean water for their children. It's not what we call rampage. There was not a single murder, not a single rape. And so, because we have this kind of tendency to, to exaggerate that. And it sounds like I and my colleagues in the media are partly to blame. You've probably heard this phrase in English, if it bleeds, it leaves. You know, the more violent, the more horrific the event, the more attention we pay to it, which actually, from what you were just saying, is almost optimistic. In other words, violence or catastrophe is exceptional. And kindness and peace are the everyday norm, which is why we don't feature it in our headlines. You no, know, we've seen that in Nepal during this last tragic uh, yeah. earthquake. You know, it's, it's just the norm. Of course, there is moments of uh, tragedy and panic the moment it happens, but right after, you get calm, you get solidarity, you get people organizing each other, helping to start. 95% of the thing is done by the local people, not just by the rescuers who come from the, here and there with dogs. And they do come and they do help, but most of the work is done by this movement of solidarity and the best of people comes at the surface. And that's much more the rule than the exception. And I think one thing I got a lot from your book was that altruism is different from compassion. And compassion is different from pity. You have this beautiful quote from somebody who says that pity arises out of sorrow, compassion arises out of love. But I think in our minds, we often confuse compassion and altruism. How would you define So all those them? words, of course, it just means, you know, basically the, it's all about the definition that we put uh, behind them. Mm. So pity is a sort of uh, feeling, uh, you feel sorry, but powerless. And, and I remember the Dalai Lama gave one this example. You know, you fly over the Pacific Ocean, and you see someone you know, swimming there. He, 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 I don't know how he got there, but he's swimming. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's hopeless. So you can't do much from you, you know, very far in the airplane. There's no one to signal. So you feel sorry, but you know, powerless. Now, there's a little mist of you know, some fog. And there's an island a quarter of a mile away. And the guy is smiling in the wrong direction. So now, because there's a possibility of that person being saved, you know, if he, could I do something, you know, send a message or make a sign? Or, so the fact that there's a possibility to come out of suffering is right to this very strong, powerful compassion because there is a possibility to overcome. So no, I think definition helps, and also because they, they concern different mental states. So altruism 
is basically an intention and a determination to achieve something good for others. No. It is genuine altruism is that your primary goal. You may get some you know, bonus, like the warm glow, the happiness of having, feeling you did something really great, one of the best things you did in life, but that's kind of a, a secondary effect. Your main goal was without calculating, you know, if I do that, it's going to do that to me, that's going great, I'll get more out of it than what I'm giving. So that's, of course, uh, not genuine altruism, it's kind of interested altruism. Uh, it happens, it's not bad necessarily. You know, reciprocal altruism in a village where every, everybody helps each other for the crops, to build house, they all come, that's great. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, there's also mutual interest, let's say. Mm -hmm. but, and there are moments where we feel unconditionally, you know, I want this child to be happy, I, I want that person to be happy. Mm -hmm. Now, when that meets with suffering, so we just call it compassion, that's the shape that the benevolent, benevolent wish of others' happiness takes, when it meets suffering, which becomes like the two sides of a coin, it becomes the wish, may suffering and the cause of suffering uh, be dispelled. So now, empathy, uh, it's a little bit now uh, slightly uh, used in the many, many different ways, especially in Europe. I don't know if it's the case here. Uh, almost empathy is almost synonymous with altruism. Mm. And uh, that's, I think, uh, not quite correct because empathy has a very precise role. Empathy has two kinds. One is emotional resonance. You now, you come, I see you smiling. I immediately feel some kind of uh, joy of see you smiling. I know it's because of you. It's not just con emotional contagion. But you know, I do feel that. If I see, if I'm a nurse, if I see someone who, or a social worker, or anyone who sees someone in deep pain and suffering, I do suffer because of that person's suffering. And the suffering is real. You can show that in the brain. Mm -hmm. Now imagine, so basically, you are a caregiver. And then your you know, patients, either they cure, or they die, whatever. But it's very rare that you have to deal with some, we are someone, a patient that is in intense suffering for 10, 50 years. So it's very, very exceptional. But if you suffer day after day because of the suffering of, of repeatedly exposed to intense suffering, the people, the patient change, but you are there, it, if you only that's what you have, it's too much. So you come to exhaustion, burnout. And so what people tell you now, you have to keep a distance, protect yourself. OK, if that's the only way to do, it's better to do that than burning out. But isn't it there a better way? So we explore that with neuroscientist Tanya Singer at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. And what we found, because she asked me to go in the scanner and say, you know, do, what, do your stuff, you know, the Buddhist meditation. <laughs> so I, I, you know, we, had a, we could communicate. And then it was a quite uh, advanced uh, type of MRI, which was real-time fMRI. So you could see immediately something, roughly what was going on in the brain. So after 10 minutes, she said, what are you doing? So I do a compassion meditation. He says, that's not what we see normally with empathy. Come out. We have to talk. <laughs> so then we, we talked, and they said, you know, could you just do empathy? Leave alone that compassion stuff, you know. So I said, well, I can try. So I'd, I'd visualize, I'd seen a BBC documentary on Romanian children who were in, in, a, in a home, hospice, terrible condition. You know, sometimes would break their bones just by walking. They were so frail. So those images, I tried to focus again and again and again, I tried to keep love and compassion out, but just <laughs> resonating. So when I mentioned that to the Dalai Lama, he says, how can you stop compassion? You know? I say, well, I, I, normally we would not do that, but that's what. So focus on suffering again and again. Within an hour in the MRI, I was completely burned out. Yeah. So then Tanya said, well, uh, would you like to make a break, or shall we move to the compassion meditation? I said, please, you know, <laughs> let me do it. <laughs> Finally, give me the permission. So then when I, I turned, it was. I think I ne since I never done that before, just uh, empathy, empathy. Mm. It was like a very powerful, like a, 
the, like a dam breaking out of a flow, a stream of sort of this feeling of embracing warm heart, loving kindness, instead of feeling powerless and a little bit disgusted and all that. Completely changed. And in the brain, it was like day and night. So since then, Tanya repeated that with other practitioners, and she could show that it's completely different circuitry in the brain. And what she's doing now, for one year, with, she just finished the study, with 350 volunteers to do three months of mindfulness, three months of loving kindness, and three months of cognitive like perspective taking. And she could show that the, the loving kindness meditation is actually an antidote to the empathic distress. So in brief, we could say that standalone empathy mm. is a bit like an electric pump without water. It burns. And you need the water of love and compassion. So that, that could have wonderful you know, applications in the medical world, in social workers mm. who constantly <laughs> face this problem of burnout. Yeah, I was just reading how if you show a picture of one child who's suffering and say, please, will you contribute $10,000? Many people will do so. If you show a picture of five people, let's say, in, in the same village suffering, please give $10,000, they won't. In other words, the empathy is going in against the compassion. And we're so relating to that one kid that it neutralizes our ability to see five kids who are all individuals. But when you were talking just a minute ago, I was also remembering how the first time I spent a lot of time with His Holiness, Dalai Lama, I really understood how passive, passive is passivism and passiveness are exactly the opposite. The passivism is an action and an intention. Mm. And to use your word, it's an intervention. It's not just standing back from the world. It's actually bringing a clear light into the middle of the struggle. Um, and I think that's often not understood when people but, talk about nonviolence. But nonviolence is definitely not passive. No, exactly. It's actually yeah. the most courageous. Yeah, you right. know, the, the Burmese monk who were barefoot in front of you know, harmed people yeah, yeah. is so much more courageous than being on the roof and, and, yeah. and shooting like a sniper. You yeah. know? So yes, it's, it, it take, you know, Gandhi, it, the, the salt mass, it takes immense courage. Yeah. You know, yeah. Those are not weak people. Yeah. No. <laughs> and also, nonviolence doesn't mean that you cannot be strict and possibly use forcible means. Yeah. It means that your only goal is to avoid harming someone voluntarily, that you want to minimize suffering by all means. You always give preference to dialogue. So it's a, it's a, there's no place for hatred, but there could be place for being firm and uh, you know, resolute and uh, standing your ground and not. So this is quite different. Yes. Yeah, easier to eliminate your hateful thoughts than to eliminate your enemies. And I think people often say to you, well, how does altruism feature when somebody of malevolent intent, a terrorist, comes into this room? How does altruism respond to that? Well, if it's only one terrorist, maybe we can, we can manage something. <laughs> yeah. uh, depends what. You know, the Lama was told, but what about this non-violence? You know, if someone comes with a gun and is going to mm -hmm. kill all of us, what do you do? So I'll first shoot in the legs, and if he falls down, I'll come and pet his head. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, one of the questions that, uh, you know, we, we had mm -hmm. in the Berkeley, <laughs> San Francisco, yeah. Berkeley was, you know, and again and again, I heard that. You know, it was same in the Iraq War. People say, "What about your meditation? What it can do with Sudan and Iraq War?" And someone told us about ISIS. You know, how do you react with ISIS? First of all, I think this question by itself is sort of not fair. That thinking that uh, something like having a, a benevolent and loving attitude is going to solve it will be the remedy now to that issue is like. You know, why are we waiting that the forest is in fire? And, and that would have been efficient at the time of the spark, because nothing started without some hatred, with some lack of education, some lack of care for bringing education, for anything that would, you know, when there's a huge epidemic, and then everybody is falling, and you say, well, what about your silly vaccination? You know, what does it do to this? How can you stop the epidemic? We do stupid vaccination. No, vaccination is to prevent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's so many things we can do before the forest is in fire that we neglected to do. Mm -hmm. And every single genocide, there were so many precursor signs that we have ignored. I was telling you that in the case of the Khmer Rouge, I know a Jesuit French father 
Five years at the row, he went every year and told, you know, this thing is coming, and nobody thought, you know, that it was serious. So, in a way, whatever you could do to, you know, raise benevolence and so forth has to be done at the earlier stage <laughs> to take in consideration. Nobody is born as someone whose only idea when he's seven years old is to blow off the world and cut people's head. You know, it just happened for many different circumstances. Yeah. So in that case, what is the role of compassion? Yes. First of all, is that to use any means that is needed to minimize suffering, but no place for hatred. Mm -hmm. The reason is that, of course, we could have moral judgment. This is absolutely without excuse. This is 100% you know, blamable, there's no any, it's inexcusable, this is the horrific, but compassion is <coughs> not about a moral judgment. Compassion, precise role is to address the cause of suffering wherever they are and whatever shape they take. Mm -hmm. So you cannot deny that terrorists are bringing, or, or, or any dictator is bringing immense suffering to the world. So then you will think, what are the possibilities for addressing the causes of that suffering? So you may say, well, what about if any possible means that that hatred, that cruelty, that indifference, that greed, whatever it is, if there's a way to somehow it could be eradicated, that would be great. Who will not wish that the dictator would change? Maybe not realistic, maybe not possible now, yeah. but at least you can have that wish without, you know, sort of minimizing the harm they do, without having some kind of contempt for the victims. So that is what compassion is about. So compassion is the way a physician will look at a very sick, mad person. So however terrible the sickness is, the physician is going to see is there a cure or not, not just bashing the patient with a stick. No, and that analogy of the forest fire, of course, speaks to everybody in California, because we have a lot of forest fires. Uh, and I was once in the middle of one, and my house burnt down, oh, yes. 440 other houses burnt down that day. And I quickly saw that, as you said, by then it was far too late. And although now we're all living in imperiled places in the hills of California, we can wish for more DC-10s or better helicopters or 10,000 firefighters instead of 500, none of that is really going to help. What is going to help is, as you said, avoiding throwing the spark, being vigilant about not throwing the matches in the brush, and clearing the brush. In other words, all the precautionary things we do so that the fire never starts. Because once it starts, there's no stopping it. And I was, so that's I was why it's not so fair you know, to say, yeah. ah, what your meditation can do with South Sudan. You know, well, you know, there could be something to be done when, people, yeah. when hatred begins in people's mind. Yeah. And I think I've also heard you say that meditation is, is like the construction of a hospital. So if you see children in suffering on the street, of course you want to help them. But actually, you also have to do the hard work of creating a hospital where they can be cured for, rather than just racing out and trying well, to Well, that's maybe to answer the, the, the question when people say, isn't it selfish when you go yeah. uh, three months in your hermitage uh, to meditate? That you could help people. And I say, well, first of all, if one of the main goals is to get rid of selfishness, you know, uh, then it doesn't seem too selfish. Right. And then the example of the hospital, yes, while you are doing this building up, this courageous compassion, you know, it's like building the hospital, or the pipe, the electricity, the cement, doesn't cure anybody. Yeah. But when it's ready, it's so much more powerful. Yeah. So the best advice I could give you know, to people who wants to work in the field of humanitarian activity, you know, I've been involved now for 15 years. Now we accomplish 140 projects. Every year we uh, treat 120,000 patients in India, Nepal, and Tibet, plus the kids we put in school. During the uh, recent earthquakes, since one month, we have been helping 70,000 people in 200 villages with food, medicine, and all that. So first of all, obviously, this is some of the consequences of, for all of us having trained in that. But you know, at the same time, uh, one of the advice I would give to anyone who works in the humanitarian work is to train those qualities. Because how you see many projects failing, it's not that there is nothing to do in this world. It's not that there are no resources. It's usually most NGO collapse because of internal problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's either the worst case is corruption, but it's also very often clashes of ego. 
and everything goes wrong. And then you completely hijack of your noble intention to help others because of human shortcomings. So it would be a good, uh, you know, instead of you know, all kinds of training they do for NGOs, the, one of the best one would be to, to develop the inner resources that you can go through all that with a clear goal, you know, to build a clinic, to build a school, and not get hijacked by all those you know, hopes and fear and how the people treat you and the inner gratitude, all this stuff, you know, just keep going. Yeah. In an everyday level, though, so often what we're encountering is the choice between one good and another good, or one form of kindness and another kindness. If we're a parent, if we're a teacher, if we're a spouse, let's say our child comes and says, Daddy, I don't want to go to school today because I want to go and help somebody. How do we bring an altruistic response to, I mean, <laughs> and there are many such situations, that's just one of many, but. Um, well, you know, again, if you use. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a No, you, you have to here. use, first of all, there's one thing that we can always check is the motivation. No, no matter what. No, you cannot, it's, it's not always easy to predict the outcome and the short-term and long-term consequences of your action. Mm. We lack sometimes information, sometimes there's so many unpredictable parameters, and we are not enlightened, so we may lack some kind of wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least we can check the motivation. Yeah. And we don't do that often enough, I guess. Mm -hmm. So then the motivation, and I remember the Sonia Dalai Lama expressing it very clearly and in detail. He said, first we must check, I am doing this for myself or for others. So of course, just to clear away something, altruism is not about sacrifice. The idea that something can be only altruistic if it really costs you and it's so painful, you know, I'm going to do that, but I hate it, but I have to do that because I'm altruistic. That's so silly. <laughs> no, altruism is the only and the best way to become happy yourself as a bonus. You know, it's like a, you, cr you grow a crop for the, for the wheat, for the rice, you get the, the hay with it, you didn't do it for that, but you get it as a bonus. So the twofold accomplishment of others' happiness and yours comes through altruism. Mm -hmm. Pursuit of selfish happiness is doomed to fail. Me, me, me all day long, very uncomfortable. Everyone thinks you are in pain, and then it doesn't work because it assumes you are independent entities while we are interdependent. So that's not working. But besides that, you have to, motivation has to be checked. And so there's nothing wrong to wish your happiness. You are one human being, you, why not? So, why, <laughs> so that's part of compassion to wish also to, to be happy. But is it mostly for me or, or, or for others? That means others are many and you are usually one, mm. yes? <laughs> Unless you have split personality or something like that. <laughs> so then, is it for the short term or is it for fewer number or greater number? Mm. And is it for the short term or for the long term? Mm. So maybe for the short term, you know, it might be nice, but maybe for the long term, again, like the hospital building, if your uh, child, uh, you know, uh, gain more capacity to help others, in Buddhist, we give the example of uh, if you want, you're a beggar and you want to give a banquet to 100 beggars. You know, you don't have it. Okay. So you need to build up something that you have the capacity to help. So in, ideally, it should be for the greater number and for the long term. Mm. So, of course, every single action, if we have to calculate all that, is maybe a bit cumbersome, <laughs> but it becomes sort of natural to intuitively check, is, I'm, do I'm really concerned by the happiness and suffering of others when I do that. Mm. Just writing a book for you know, is a thing that you know, is a big undertaking. Mm. So the first thing, why I'm doing that? Is it really for the only reason that even it helps one person is worth doing? Mm. So if you continue with that motivation, that that's really keep you in the right direction. And I know the Dalai Lama always says, this is related, you can always condemn the action, but not the actor. Yeah, that's and so important. It's beautiful. Yeah, I remember I was once traveling in a bullet train with him in Japan, and I just read a book on Mao Zedong. And I'd read that Mao Zedong had written in the margin of one book, if something's black and I say it's white, it's white. If something is up and I say it's down, it's down. In other words, my, my word trumps everything. I'm the only authority. And I cited this to His Holiness, and he grabbed my arm, and he said, never say anything about Mao Zedong. You can criticize his actions, but never criticize the man. And he's speaking about the man who tried to destroy Tibet and brought so much suffering. I was really humbled and moved that he would have that degree of 
in some sense, compassion and altruism for the person and his human potential and his Buddha nature and his original goodness, even in the midst of all the ways which have gone wrong. Um, so when, when you say that to someone, they say, but it is the person who did the action. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and they think they have the final argument. <laughs> but you see, there's a beautiful image in the, one of classic uh, Buddhist texts which called The Way of the Bodhisattva. And he said, when someone beats you with a stick, nobody gets angry with the stick. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? It'll be silly, no? <laughs> but some people might kick the stick, but basically, you know, when you bump into a stone, you kick it a second time, but that's kind of silly. <laughs> so nobody gets angry with the stick, you get angry with the person. Yeah. But, but the, the text goes on, but that's just as silly. The person is, man is sort of manipulated by hatred or by anger, just like the person is manipulating the stick. So the real enemy is not the person, but hatred. So it doesn't mean that at that moment, the action of the person who is under the power of hatred, who does nothing or can't do, maybe for some reason, nothing against that state of mind that's overwhelming, mm. uh, is not uh, that whole situation is not something that will be counteracted by any possible means. Mm. But the idea that it is the person is fundamentally you know, evil or degraded or something f fundamentally evil with at the heart of the structure of the person, that's where the mistake is. Because it's like if you have a deep, a, a, a grave sickness. You know, my sister, uh, she's uh, two years younger than me, but when she's 42, she, be, she had Parkinson. Mm. And all her life she says, I'm not a Parkinsonian, I have the Parkinson. So in the sense that if, if you go to the doctor and say you have a flu, you go, doctor, I am the flu. Yeah. Can, what can you do for me? You say, I have the flu. So you know you suffer from a, a sickness. So anger, hatred, jealousy, craving, arrogance, those are sickness of the mind. So the idea that there is something you know, behind the screen of thoughts, behind the screen of emotion, that basic cognitive faculty. You know, in Buddhism, we call it the luminous aspect of the mind. It doesn't mean that it shines in the dark, but that what allows to, to, to know everything, to know emotions, to know hatred, to know love, but which is not tainted by neither of those. That cannot be spoiled. And it's a very simple reason. Because the, its function is to know. If you are aware of hatred, that awareness is not, is not angry, it's just aware. Mm. It's like a beam of light. If you shine something on a heap of garbage, the light doesn't become dirty. If you shine on a heap of gold, it doesn't become expensive. Mm. Light is what reveals. So the basic consciousness, because of its very fundamental nature, it cannot be. Uh, permeated by that, or like a mirror. You know, many, why you don't buy a new mirror every day? If, you know, it could be a mirror, you can look and save 10 times and then you have to throw it because it's full. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can look at yourself a thousand times. I would not advise that because you will fall <laughs> in the category of the narcissistic <laughs> epidemic. But a mirror can reflect a thousand angry face, a thousand smiling face. Why? Because the face doesn't belong to the mirror. The mirror mm. allows that. So because of that, which is the fact, you know, if you look within, you see that it, it is the potential for changing the contents. Mm. So that's why nobody is irremediably evil. Even they might have, from young age, strong tendencies toward harming, like psychopath. They begin by torturing animals, then they move on. But even that, there's something always that is, has to be unspoiled, and you could sort of bring that at the surface. Mm. So the Buddhist example is like, a, and I, I mentioned, I, re, I recall uh, speaking with the people who were in jail for 25 years, and they, they, they said, you know, when, usually when we get spiritual advice, they tell us that, First of all, we are born in a kind of uh, sinful manner, and then we are also committed a huge sin. So we are you know, these twofold sinners, and then we are caught for many, many years in this jail, so it doesn't look very good. But if we, when you say that, yes, we have done that, yes, we are in this situation, but we are more like this idea of a nugget of gold that is fallen in the most dirty, abominable place, 
But you pick it up, you can polish, and the gold will shine. It has always been gold, but simply it was messed up in a huge way. So that gives us kind of idea of a potential. Yeah. You have a potential for change, and that can be put to use. That's the lotus in the mud almost, isn't it? So. That's lotus in the mud, that's the gold in, the, in its ore, or the gold fallen in, you know, in the dirty toilets, or whatever you, yes. you may think of. So if somebody here says, well, I loved what Matthias said about altruism, how do I develop it in myself? How do I go home and embark on uh, cultivating this attribute? What would you recommend? Well, you know, I think also this is just really one aspect of the question, if I may say, mm. because uh, if you just develop in yourself, it's great. And, you know, uh, uh, if you, may, you want to make a beautiful garden, every flower has to be fresh and beautiful, so human society is made of individuals. But that will not be enough. And I remember a French philosopher, no, French philosopher, sort of, they have something, uh, you know, they always have something to argue about. They don't, they don't, <laughs> like, they don't like happiness. <laughs> you know, when I wrote this book on happiness, there was a, a review called The Dirty Works of Happiness. And so, and they don't like that much meditation either. So one of them said, you know, it's nice your meditation, but you're never going to change society, institution, and like that. So why? Ah, because, you know, institution, you know, we are the same like Aristotle. Aristotle, uh, you know, I'm, he said, I don't feel I'm a better human being than Aristotle, but Aristotle was in favor of slavery. No, we are not, because institutions change. It's not because human beings change. I thought about that. I said, well, what he was saying in scientific terms, he said we have the same genes as Aristotle. We know that. Mm. Human genome hasn't changed. There's a small gene for assimilation of milk that slightly changed, that's all. But to have an altruistic gene might take 50,000 years, so this, we cannot put our hopes in that. <laughs> but there's many ways to change individually. You can train your mind. And that neuroscience says neuroplasticity. You can be exposed to a different environment, and epigenetics tell you that your genes might be expressed or not. It's not just to get the genes, it's like a blueprint. But if you build a different house once you get the blueprint, or if you have 100 lights and some are off, some are on, those who are off, it's like they are not there. So there's many ways that you can become a different person. Now, when a certain number of person uh, with a certain vision of the world or certain ideas that slavery is an abomination get a critical mass, there's a change of culture. And that's the magic of the whole thing, is the articulation between evolution of culture and individual change. So both have to be possible. So for your employer, your first part of your question, individual change is, is possible through training the mind. And then it is a kind of mystery while it seems so not obvious to everyone. Because any skill that we have, you know, did we didn't get it through some kind of training? I mean, who was born learning and knowing how to read and write, to play chess, to play the guitar, to play anything? How many hours for professional training? Now, it, it comes to altruism, you know, attention, open presence, kind of emotional balance. And that's, well, that's who I am. Take it or leave it. What does that mean? Then, if you say that when you're three years old, what, what quality, quality you will develop? Mm -hmm. So why those fundamental human qualities should be the exception that they are sort of grave in stone and nothing can change. That just doesn't make sense. And we know that we may not have the same potential, the same margin, in the same way that not everyone will become a marathon Olympic champion, but we can start running decently. We can start playing the piano decently if we do, if we do little exercise every day. <laughs> so in that sense, you know, if we start training those qualities, not just by taking 15 seconds of unconditional benevolence that we might feel for a child, for a loved one, but nurturing that you know, for 10 minutes. Why not? We do all kinds of things for 10 minutes. I promise you that if a 
one of my friends from Nepal or Tibet comes in one of those cities and you know, some of the gyms you can see through the window and they see all those guys running on those treadmills or bicycle that goes nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> they will be astonished. They said, this is like a madhouse or what? <laughs> <laughs> those people tiring themselves, sweating, they just go nowhere at all. <laughs> Are they doing some kind of you know, punishment for something, a crime they committed? <laughs> They have been assigned to do one week of you know, treadmill. <laughs> but we know we do that because we know it's good for mental and physical health. Mm. So why could we not do that for compassion? In fact, you, one of the great things in your book is you describe compassion gymnasia as something you can have in corporations, children being taught to train their minds as well as training their bodies. And I think one of the most optimistic things that I carry away from your work is also what you mentioned a few minutes ago, which is neuroplasticity. 20 years ago, I think people more or less assumed that the brain was something fixed, like our arms and legs. And now we found through the scientific research in which you've been involved, we can grow whole parts of our minds or diminish them if we don't pay attention to them. And, I, and so there's visible empirical scientific proof that we can develop qualities and actually change the contours of our brains. And right? the good news for someone like me who was almost 70 and hardly beginning meditation is that you can change the last moment, your last breath, basically. <laughs> And that was fun, actually. You know, the big discovery of, in neuroscience over the last 20 years mm. was neuroplasticity. That mm. means throughout life. You know, it was thought before that this, the brain is so complex mm. that when it gets the kind of adult state, uh, finally everything is more or less in place. Don't mess up with that brain, you know, so nothing would happen. But in fact, it's constantly changing. You know, if you train into something like juggling, you can manufacture 30,000 new neurons every month you know, in certain areas of the brain related to what you train in. So it, the brain is constantly changing. And the good news also, it is not only like you know, the first studies we did with neuroscientists was with meditators who had between 10,000 to 60,000 hours of meditation because obviously when you begin a new field of research, it's always nice to expect the strongest difference. So you go for the the most trained, you know, <laughs> at least if, and, but then after that, of course, that will not help society so much if everyone has to do 60,000 hours of meditation, that's a full-time job. <laughs> so, but what neuroplasticity is beautiful is it starts within a few hours. There was a study in Israel showing that after six hours, you already see micro neuroplasticity starting to happen. So if you do one month, 20 minutes a day, there's not only a functional change, but a structural change in the brain. And it can be in a, for you know, increasing sort of something like assimilating training, but it also could be decreasing some other things. Like there was a training of two weeks, 30 minutes a day on compassion that Richard Davidson and uh, someone did in his lab, Ellen Wang. And you could see a shrinking within two weeks of the amygdala, which is the area of the brain that has to do with fear and anger, fight or flight response, and just two weeks. Mm. So that shows that if you pursue regularly, even a short training, but with time, you're bound to change. And then when individuals start to change, then gradually around them things change, and, and then there could be a tipping point for culture change. And for culture to change, we don't need to have everyone to change. A, a sort of a strong current of ID can make the tipping point occur. And it happens many occasions in history. You know, abolition of slavery. You know, Ten people decided that it was not OK. They went to the British Parliament. They said, you are fools. Ha, ha, ha. The first, the British Empire economy will collapse without slavery. Impossible. Ten years later. Nobody, it was abolished, and nobody today can say, no, it was not so bad. You know, it was a quite a nice means to run the economy, after all. It's not possible. The idea is gone. So likewise, I think the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, 10 people decided to do that. It was adopted. And now who will uh, come back on this? Who will take away the, the right of, to vote for, uh, for women? You know, that is, and many things change through the culture. You know, in France, uh, in Europe, 250 years ago, it was very common, Saturday afternoon, 
you're not going to see a baseball match or in France they didn't have baseball but other sports like now, but you will go to witness public torture. They will hang people, they will put them on the wheel and, and break their bones. That was stuff you will take you know, your wife and kids to see that. It doesn't exist. Voltaire was upset about one of them because it turned out he was innocent on top of that. So he made a big case, but that was practiced almost everywhere. You can't even imagine that, although they are still barbaric acts, but basically throughout the world this is no more acceptable. So culture can change, and that's the good news. And I think, as I understand it, in your tradition, there's meditation and there's meditation. Some of us associate meditation with emptying the mind, and some associate it with, with developing focus. But I think what you were talking about, for example, when you were imagining the Romanians as you went into the lab, was a meditation where you're deliberately tilting your mind towards mm -hmm. altruism others. Is that right? Is that particularly the, the defense? Well, you know, me? yes, because meditation is a generic term. Yeah. No, it's like you say, oh, I'm training. Yeah. What, yeah. chess or badminton? Yeah. So any, so mind is training the mind. So what do you train? Loving kindness or focused compassion is not quite the same. And in the brain, of course, you see very different signatures. Mm. So there are many kinds of mind training. And actually, that uh, fits very well with the Sanskrit root. Mm. You know, the words uh, bhavana means to cultivate. In Tibetan, there's a word which we translate by meditation, which means to become familiar with something. Mm. So you could become familiar with, uh, altru with compassion, with altruism, with uh, uh, familiar with a new way of perceiving others. Mm. You could you know new way of translating the outer world in happiness or misery. That makes a big difference. Mm. But you could also become familiar with that, what I mentioned before, this basic you know, awareness, this pure awareness, luminous awareness devoid of content, which is not emptying your mind, but seeing the root of the pure awareness that is at the root of everything, mm. which we're not so familiar with, if you ask someone what is the nature of your mind, they say, what nature of mind does that mean sometimes? But if you become familiar with that notion through your experience, then you are familiarizing yourself. It's not just cultivating with effort. So all these fall within the sphere of what we call meditation. So you see just emptying your mind and relaxing is a pretty reductionist view of meditation. Yeah. Because anyway, if you empty your mind, it won't be, it won't be empty very long. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> you have a beautiful line, actually, in your book on happiness, in which you says, say happiness is a way of interpreting the world. And I think altruism, as you described it just now, is in some ways it's, it's a way of working on the mind so that you're seeing the world differently. Um, so. Well, it is because, uh, you see, you could be miserable in a little paradise. I mean, we know that. Yeah. We hear of people who are very rich, very famous. On top of that, they are beautiful, everything. So-called everything to be happy, right? We hear that formula. Then we hear they got a big nervous breakdown, depression. Hey, what's wrong with this guy? If I don't like, of course I'll be happy. But that's the problem. It's, uh, he, you know, it's not the case. And then you see people who face great adversity and still they have this incredible sort of strength and joy. So the mind can override that. Yeah. So that's very important. But I think also in the global picture, you know, why I think altruism has a good chance to succeed? And then back to the scientist casket. You know, evolution selects traits. You know, it's not pushing things. And the traits are the most favorable to survival. If you look now at the situation, you know, 10,000 years ago, there was 5 million human beings on Earth. No, no big deal. You know, they would, couldn't have no impact on the planet. So now we enter the Anthropocene. We are the major actors. We are determining the fate of future generations. So then, now, uh, we need more cooperation. The cooperation is a, a trade that should emerge rather than competition, because we are all interested is to, to sort of work together. We're on the same boat. So that should be the trade that we become enhanced. And there have been the kind of models showing that if you take you know, an altruist and a selfish one by one against each other, the good guys will be eliminated because the other ones are merciless. But if you take a group of altruistic people, they have a tendency to aggregate, you know, to work together. They sort of like, appreciate each other. They, they like to cooperate. 
But the other group is not even a group, it's a bunch of you know, <laughs> selfish people that constantly you know, kick each other's leg. As a group, they will be less, less prosperous, so that's a, a good thing. And then finally, I think with the main argument of, the, of those 900 pages, if I can spare you reading the whole thing, <laughs> is that I realized by meeting all these great minds, you know, great philosophers, economists, and scientists of all fields, that one of the main challenges of our time is to reconcile three time scales, because we have a schizophrenic division between the short term. You know, the economy is always about the short term. And if economy doesn't go well, everything else will go to the drain. Well, economy should be at the service of society to begin with. But it is true that it's more on the short term. Then we have the quality of life. That's your life, you know, whatever long time you live, a family, a career, and that life satisfaction is measured by two things. The first, what is the quality of your experience moment after moment? And then how do you look at 10 years, 20 years, with sense of fulfillment or frustration or regret? That's what matters after all. And then you have the long term, which is the new challenge. Because we didn't, before, we didn't have that impact on the future generation. It was minimal. Mm -hmm. But now we are the main actors. Mm -hmm. They will say, you knew, and yet you did nothing. Mm -hmm. Because we are actually deciding on their fate. So now, it's, it's quite depressing when environmentalists speak to economists, knowing that's what's going to happen in 50 years, or politicians, and they say, come back in 49 years, we'll see. But it's no more possible. So this is a kind of schizophrenic dialogue. So we need a concept, because after all, not, of course, most people would like to have a better world mm. and to find a, a mutually agreeable solution to our difficulties. But on what platform? On what basis? Mm. And that's where the notion of consideration for others mm. is the only concept that can, no, OK, now we can speak the same language. If I have more consideration for others, I will go for a caring economics. Because there's two things that the selfish economy cannot do, which is to address the idea, the, no, the problem of poverty in the midst of plenty. You know, the definition of the homo economicus is maximization of personal preference and interest. And it's supposed to rule everybody and to be the magic formula. But in fact, first of all, we are not just doing that. Mm -hmm. And second, you will never remedy to poverty in the midst of plenty with this principle. The second thing it cannot do is address the common goods, quality of the air, of the oceans, you know, the pursuit of justice and democracy. You have to step out of just maximizing. So that's why we need caring economics. Then we need, on the midterm, to favor the condition that would allow people to flourish, to express their potential, their aspiration, to access to education, to be reasonably out of conflict and violence, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then, in the long term, if you have consideration for others, you're not going to jeopardize the fate of future generations. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to uh, cite uh, my grand friend Marx, but not, Gra not Karl Groucho. <laughs> and, and he said, why should I care for future generations? What did they do for me? <laughs> so that's basically what you know, a few billionaires say. You know, I find absurd to change my behavior for something that will happen in 100 years. So the problem is that it will happen. We won't be there, but many, many others will be there. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know, the question of the environment is complex, scientifically, politically, economically. It boils down to altruism versus selfishness. So it becomes very pragmatic mm -hmm. concept, not just a luxury when everything goes well, or sort of novel, ideal. It's the concept that can bring a solution. So that's why. I'm totally in favor of the altruistic revolution. <laughs> I, I remember, actually, um, his, the Dalai Lama's youngest brother, who, of course, is an incarnate Lama himself, he shares his holiness's gift to making things very pragmatic, as you were saying, and accessible and ecumenical. And he just said to me one day, well, every morning you're taking a shower, and you're spending 20 minutes in the shower. You could be thinking about the Warriors game you're missing while hearing about altruism. You could be talking about the U2 concert at the Fabulous Forum last week. 
Or you could be thinking about everything that's coming in the day to come and bringing some light of altruism towards it, thinking of the people you meet. And just in those 20 minutes, which otherwise go idle, you can begin to train your mind. And what you do in those 20 minutes actually reflects everything that follows in the next 20 hours. So it was, a, I thought, a very nice practical way of reminding us how we have the capacity to do it, again, regardless of our tradition at any moment. So there's two uh, nice counterpoints to what you said. One is in traditional Buddhism. There's a practice where you use every seemingly neutral, you know, kind of boring stuff as, as a reminder of compassion and altruism. For instance, if you wake up, you think, oh, may I wake up all beings from the sleep of ignorance. If you, if you go upstairs, you know, climb the stairs, you say, may I, I take people out of you know, deprivation and suffering. So, and if you take a shower, may I sort of wash all those you know, seeds of suffering of all sentient beings. So to sort of relate something neutral that normally is neither good nor bad, let's say, neither virtuous nor unvirtuous, to something good. So that's the traditional, you have sutras the, the, using those examples for almost everything you can do. Yeah. But then there's another, if you take the modern technological version, that is what my friend Meng at Google has said, and he's called his big secret, and that's the 10 second meditation every hour. So when he said that, it's about compassion. So when he said that, uh, we were in Madison with uh, Richard Davidson and his holiness, and I thought, you know, you know, if many is a good friend, I said, this guy is too much, you know, 10 seconds, you know, really, really that's, uh, can't get, you know, it's like, uh, the, it's like the Twitter of meditation. <laughs> <laughs> but I found it's much deeper than what it looks. So what is, what is those 10 seconds? Every hour, maybe not every hour, but say, this is six times a day, it would not be too bad. First of all, nobody can say they don't have 10 seconds. But you, you, over and again, I don't have 20 minutes, but 10 seconds, I don't, I, I don't tell me that. Okay. So now what you do for 10 seconds, you don't jump around people's neck for 10 seconds because you might get in trouble if you're that in the street or at the office. But for 10 seconds, you look around, or even there's nobody, you look through the window or in the street, or you imagine people if you happen to be alone, and you think, may this person be happy May this person flourish in life. May that person and his dear ones and be spared suffering and so forth. Really from your heart, 10 seconds. There's not too much asking, right? And then, OK, you might think 10 seconds. Then you start again you know, saying nasty things. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ten you know why it's not the, it's a, and I, I gave this image to Meng to, to, uh, to, know, to, make it, to help him do, <laughs> to reinforce his case. If you open a flask of perfume for 10 seconds, and then you close, the perfume will stay for quite long. And if you open it for 10 seconds at regular interval, maybe the perfume will stay all the time. So when you do that repeatedly, it sort of sets some mindset in motion. There's a trickle, and then it's maybe just join between the two 10 seconds so that you somehow are in a different frame of mind, more altruistic, more well-inclined, more benevolent, more trusting. So I think this is actually quite smart. And it, it corroborates a, a Buddhist uh, instruction for meditation that it is better to meditate for short periods, but repeated than a long one from time to time. Or it's another example, if you water your plants in apartment, you put a little water every day. If you put a bucket every three months, the plant is dead in the meantime. So. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's ask our fearless leader to come out. I think uh, Ted has three or four questions he's going to share. Yes, I, I have them. I'll read them from out okay. here. Um, the Voice first, the uh, we've got a lot of questions uh, asking about uh, the aftermath of the earthquake in Nepal, in particular to uh, your monastery. Yes, so uh, you know, uh, Foundation Karuna Sechen. So when I first started it, uh, I wanted to, someone suggested we do a formal organization in France. I wanted to call it Compassion in Action. You know, French are very secular, they said that's too religious. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, but anyway, so I call it Karuna, which means compassion, and nobody knows it. So, it's <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> so then we started uh, you know, 15 years ago. 
now we accomplish 140 projects. Uh, and then, so we have a clinic in Nepal with 50 people, doctors and nurses, and we have 500 monks who are one of the good things about monks, they are disciplined and they do whatever is necessary together. <laughs> so then when that happened, uh, we were just absolutely ready. We had actually done several rehearsals for earthquakes because we knew it was going to come one day or another. We had containers with staff and food and tools. So the monastery was uh, badly damaged structurally but didn't collapse so nobody died there. But we immediately, within you know, hours, first of all, we had 5,000 people in the monastery's compound because there was a big teaching going on with the 85 years old Lama with a big tent covering the garden and the courtyard. So we had then 5,000 people for 15 days. And we brought uh, you know, drinkable water, as much food as we could, and the monks took care. But the main thing that we started doing very soon is to go outside in the villages where the most of the damage has been done. Some villages were you know, broken down 90% of the houses. So since there are many, many, many villages in very remote, difficult of access, and most of the big organizations didn't know so much what to do, they were in Kathmandu. So we managed now, uh, most if I see, I add the numbers from what I heard last week from uh, last I, I was in touch with them, we probably have helped 70,000 people. Uh, and just, just help by saying the good words, but 70,000 people, we brought food ration for at least half a month for them, for each of them, uh, top line tents to, to make a shelter because it was raining after the earthquake, and then medicine supply uh, with the doctors to see what we could do. So in 200 villages, and now uh, after the the crops grow in July, August, so the basic foods uh, will be available. We'll move to uh, community projects, uh, rebuilding schools and dispensaries, and that probably uh, is difficult to say, but at least two years uh, we'll, we'll devote as much resources as possible for that. So because the interest is really focused on the immediate news, you could see it was first item of the news for a week, then a little bit less, and now we know it's same in every catastrophe after two, three months, it will be something else that happens in the world. So we can't expect this uh, great solidarity that, w that happened uh, in aftermath of the, earth of the earthquakes, but we'll have to continue to find help to carry that over in the long term. Yes, so thank you for asking. So the next. Our website, Karuna Sechen, has news, ways to help. And the good news from our side is that since uh, we are, uh, our vocation is that we have a very, very little overhead. It's about 4 or 5%. And there's a benefactor that covers that since a few years. So 100% of any help goes directly to the field. So that makes us feel very comfortable and uh, happy when we can report to others because we know that nothing is wasted on the way. There's at the information table outside, there's uh, more information on the monastery and how you can help if you're so interested. So, so the monastery itself, we also need rebuilding. Of course, usually there's much less enthusiasm for rebuilding monastery mm -hmm. than doing humanitarian work. So anyone who has a sort of inclination for preservation of spiritual heritage, and monastery will need a lot of help because the whole main structure has to be redone. And there's a website, sechen.org, which is dedicated not to the humanitarian side, but to the spiritual side of our activities. OK, let's say you were to return to the career of a cellular geneticist. What would be the most important takeaway, having been a monk for the last 40 years, that would be applicable to a career as a scientist? You know, in those forms, when you enter, the, you have something you have uh, NA, non applicable. <laughs> <laughs> I spent already quite, uh, uh, sorry, so to answer your question, I'm not going to go back to molecular biology, so I don't have to think what I will bring back. <laughs> but I do spend a lot of time, relatively, I mean, in the in neuroscience labs. And so what do I bring?
from uh, not being a monk. You know, being a monk is, a, is just like a, a detail. It's true. For me, it was just changing clothes. Uh, but the important thing is to devote you know, 50 years of your life to study with those great masters and practice. Whether I'm a monk or not, it's, it's a convenient choice. You know, Only two, two pairs of shoes, one set of clothes is so much easier. <laughs> no car, no land, no house. But it's freedom, so that's the choice. Uh, but I think what I always kept from the scientific background is this uh, strong inclination for some kind of rigor, you know, no nonsense. And that Buddhism is really also about bridging the gap between appearance and reality. So it is the same. It's a, it's a rigorous investigation of reality, but it's not just you know, you know, biology and physics, but it's also reality of mind, uh, relative and absolute realities, things like that. But what I may bring now to when I collaborate with my neuroscientist or psychologist friend is this kind of wealth of uh, knowledge which I, I don't, I'm not invented anything myself, absolutely zero. I just that kind of this uh, being the sort of uh, you know, testifying or bringing some of the traditional knowledge accumulated over many thousand years. And I think in that sense, we could say that all the meditators who have uh, collaborated with neuroscientists, psychologists, are not just guinea pigs. They're also collaborators because you see, first time you go, okay, come in the MRI, so how do we study meditation? So you go for 20 minutes and we see what, there's the peak of activity somewhere. No, it doesn't work like that. We have to compare a state of rest with state of meditation 20 times, 50 times, and then you rest for 30 seconds, you engage in meditation for two minutes. So is it possible to engage in full compassion in two minutes? Well, it happens, yes, so that's a good point. So all this we, we sort of devise together. And so in the process, it's like beta testing. You, you test a new technique, a new product, and then you refine it, or you a musician, and you start a, a piece of music, and you refine it, and to give you an example, I went for the first time in a coma lab. I didn't tell my 92 years old mother because she was already worried when they go to in those things, but if I'm told I'm going to a coma lab. So it's a world specialist of coma, and he's the first scientist who could distinguish uh, two MRI, different types of coma. People were still conscious, and they can reply by mentally moving their left or their right arm. It's fascinating. So he's in Belgium. So I went there, and there was other specialists who came from different places. Uh, they wanted to see a uh, different level of clarity of consciousness, because now you only have the waking up state, the coma state, and the deep sleep, or in conscious state, and, but there's less intermediate state. So they were to see if a meditator could engage in a very clear, limpid state, or a new meditative state that we, we named uh, what is called self-absorption in uh, cognitive opacity. That means getting in a kind of state of torpor. <laughs> so they can really stupid, like you fall in mud mentally. So anyway, so, so to do that, we sort of work together. But that sometimes can be challenging. And that's why uh, in this time, the fact of having spent long many days in hermitages helps you. Because, for instance, why is it challenging? Because you are not just nicely meditating you know, in a spa or facing the Himalayas. The last time there was this, first they put a, you know, 256 electrodes. Then you have this called transmagnetic cranial stimulation. You know, it's a nice apparatus that first wears two kilos, and the guy has to hold it, so sometimes he push on your head. And then it sends you every second for three hours a one Tesla stimulation. That's the kind of thing that normally should. So it's like you see in your brain like boom, 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 boom. And then to cancel the noise, which will perturb the analysis of the brain by the electrocephalogram, they send you what they call a white noise. You know, this is a very sweet term for <laughs> full blast. OK? And then they push on your head with that thing that was being, being. And, and before, I always refused to do that because it's supposed to maybe you might have a chance not to come back out of it. But I say, OK, I'm 17, or I can risk that, no problem. So 
And then you, know, you de you, they tell you, now you engage, and they have a, you can't hear, so they put you some screen. Now, OK, now you start your pure awareness meditation. You have this thing, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then there's another guy who come with a written thing, don't blink. <laughs> It will spoil the, the electroencephalogram. So you say like this. <laughs> Ten seconds later, relax your facial muscles. <laughs> okay, then again. And then after two, three hours, they say, no, could you fall asleep? You know, you just boom, boom, shh. <laughs> okay, fall asleep. So yeah, that. So, you know, you, you bring your expertise as a meditator to that. So <laughs> basically, that's what mind training is useful. <laughs> Next question. How do you work with fear, the kind of fear that feels so instinctual, or fear from the depths of unconscious? Each one of us has grappled at some moment with, a feel with feeling like a victim, and even if there's awareness, it's only a perception. Those intense body sensations and mental chatter take over and feel so real. So when we first, uh, I remember the first time I went to Richie Davidson's lab in 2000, you know, we were just uh, playing because we, we had a new field of you know, so-called contemplative neuroscience. So you know, everything is allowed. You can try weird things. So I first wanted to try many, many kinds of meditation. And then we didn't pursue because it's expensive. It requires that many, many more subjects. So I thought of trying six states, you know, like open presence, which is a very vivid state, compassion, focused attention, visualization, etc. One of them was fearlessness. And then the Rishi was very surprised, Rishi Davidson. He said, why fearlessness? He said, well, because it's a quality that I observe in most of my teachers, this sense of uh, being extremely kind and compassionate, but be also like a mountain that can be unshakable by the winds and the storms and the, this kind of incredible you know, faculty of having so many inner resources that you know, there's nothing that can feel sort of insecure or destabilized. You could not imagine someone like my teacher, Ken Siriboshi, or being destabilized by something. Now he will feel sadness, he will feel joy, but being destabilized, losing his bearing, that seems almost inconceivable. So then, also, when I uh, mentioned with the, uh, it is discussed with His Holiness about empathy and compassion, he said, no, empathy, when it's self-oriented, the way that others' suffering impact you, so that the more suffering, the more you become oppressed. You know, you become empathic distressed because if there's big suffering, then big oppression. While compassion is other-oriented reaction. So the more suffering, the more courage, determination. So he spoke of compassionate courage. So another of my teacher told me that compassion and uh, altruism also go with fearlessness and selfishness somehow with fear. So now, this being said, Fear, of course, is absolutely required as a basic answer to immediate danger. I mean, that fear, there's no any question about that. You know, if a rhinoceros comes full speed, you run. I mean, the guy who says, I'm fearless, you know, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> so that doesn't work. And you need, to, you need that. And it has to shortcut every other thing, because you have no time to, to ponder too many stuff. But what I guess you are referring to is a kind of more existential fear, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and feeling this despair or anguish or something. No, of course, it, unfortunately, it happens. I, I know some people who tell me that. You don't know what, so much what to say. But somehow, hope and fear go together. You, know, you have this uh, sort of, it usually comes, I mean, in Buddhism, we explain that if you start from the state of you know, pure awareness, there's not so much that very strong, solid distinction uh, because it's all this kind of unified state of awareness. But when you start to you know, discriminate self, others, and it becomes solid and more reified, 
and other becomes either a subject of, you know, could bring you some pleasure or satisfaction, so something that you need, you want to attract, or a potential threat that you want to get rid of. So it is the seed for fear or anger or hatred towards what may look, may seem like a, a, a threat or a potential dis problem or displeasure for you. And that can be magnified to an extent that you are so, you know, sense of self, uh, exaggerated sort of self-centeredness, me, 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 in a very little sort of very confined and narrow space of mental space that everything seems to threat. We have an expression in Tibetan Buddhism to say the whole world seems to arise like enemy. It's everything is a potential sort of threat to your well-being and so forth. So that's clearly a mental fabrication uh, because it's, the world is not like that. We say it's like seeing a, a rope in darkness and thinking it is a snake and you react very strongly to that. So you need light to see it's just a rope. So the snake has never been on the rope, but for you it was very real. So that sort of mental fabrication that may lead to different levels of fear, that's something that can be remedied by the mind. But the basic fear is, of course, something that's very important. The Buddhist country of Bhutan is called, by some, the happiest place on Earth. Is there a place where you are the happiest? So is it Bhutan, is it? It's known as the happiest place on earth. Oh, Bhutan. But, yes. No, it's where, not. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, they never say that. <laughs> is there, is there, is, is there a place where you magazine? feel the happiest? No, but Bhutan is, they didn't say they were the happiest, and it's not the case. They just said that <laughs> happiness should be at the heart of policies, and it's better to uh, ban for gross social happiness than gross social product, and that's very sensible, and that takes count of uh, financial wealth, soci social wealth, and environmental wealth. So this is kind of triple paradigm. I cannot give you too much detail. But to give you an example, if you only the GDP, if you buy tobacco, it's good for GDP. Then you get cancer, you go to hospital, it's good for GDP. <laughs> then the, the people have to bury you and it's expensive, it's good for GDP. But Bhutanese count it as a minus for social wealth, to give you an example. So like that. So. But uh, what was the other question? <laughs> Is there a place where you feel the happiest? Well, uh, I, rem well I, won't, I won't answer the, uh, that, but I will tell you the anecdote of it, and then I'll see if I find an answer. But <laughs> I, 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 I'll recall a beautiful experience with the Dalai Lama. We had a conference on, what was it? On attention on thing, and he really wanted having scientists from the East. So he brought a Japanese scientist who was a specialist of laughter. And uh, so he, he was to this, uh, this uh, five-day meeting, and he was supposed to speak the last day. So we all wa were waiting for this uh, specialist of laughter. But throughout the week, uh, you know, we are sitting like 10 of, 10 of scientists or Buddhist monks, and then there's a silent public of 100 people around. He didn't say a word, and he looked very stern. And then he, he did a presentation, uh, which was quite interesting. He said they made an experiment of uh, uh, bringing people with diabetes to an academic lecture, They're very serious. And then they made them sit, and then, and then they measured their diabetic level, and it was increased. <laughs> and then they say, if you have diabetes, never go to an academic lecture. <laughs> Then the next day, they took the same group and they brought a, one of the best uh, Japanese comic. And then people laugh and laugh and laugh and their diabetes level went down. So he, he did that. Then he asked His Holiness, Your Holiness, could you tell us what was the happiest moment of your life? So some silence, everyone went, wow, we are going to learn something very special. <laughs> so then Lama went uh, like this and he says, I think now. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> I won't be as pretentious that to say that now is always the happiest moment. It would be nice. But I think the most uh, rewarding moment was definitely the moments where being with my spiritual teachers, not so much when they were you know, teaching to big crowds or traveling to wonderful places in Tibet, 
But some moments where we were traveling, maybe, and there was a moment where we were sitting there doing nothing special, and then we know some kind of agenda, and then the incredible quality of their presence gives such a sense of harmony, and there's nothing better you could wish in the world. So this is the most sort of uh, complete and uh, moment I can remember. It's just sort of being and trying to mingle your little mind with this vast mind of compassion and wisdom. For me, by far, that was the most precious moment I think uh, I, I went through, yes. All right, two more questions. Um, we, know you take care, we know you take care of the health of your mind. How do you take care of the health of your body? I don't know. I know I had no insurance or social security for 40 years. I was lucky, I guess. No, last two years I got something. I don't know. Well, if you are sick, you go to see the best, the best doctor you can find or something like that. Exercise, meditate. Sleep. Sleep, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think there are many good advice for living a healthy life. So that's it. And the, uh, sorry, but you know, it's a vast question. Final question. Um, so you're a photographer. It used to be that you framed a picture, you had film, you took the picture, you turned it in to get developed, you waited, and then you saw your work. Today, you snap a picture, you look at it immediately. If you don't like it, you take more pictures. Is there anything that can be learned from the way it used to be? Well, I'm not sure. Well, the thing is, the, when I left France, the, the very kind secretary of my boss, Francois Jacob, she sort of let my salary run for six months. <laughs> that was nice, because I could live 15 years with that, spending about $30, $40 a month. And then since I was also, you know, I took some of my cameras, uh, mostly to photograph my teachers and the world around them, I really had so little means for many years. So I would take about, what, 15 rolls a year? It's not very much for a photographer. And they had to, it was quite a problem. You had to send it to Bombay, hoping that it would come back. <laughs> really, it was such a pleasure. When after three weeks, one month, you got in the mail those little rolls with the, with the box of slides, and you look at it. So because of that, uh, you know, if I look, uh, the first book I did, Journey to Enlightenment, which was uh, documenting all these 30 uh, first or 25 first years in the Himalayas, I remember extraordinary scenes, you know, where I took one shot, and I really waited, you know, is it worth it to take? And then some of them said, okay, okay, I'll take this one. But I would never double, triple, because first I tried to be careful, and second, I had to minimize films. So I don't know if I had taken 100. I guess now, knowing, for example, for portraits, how when you take several shots, there's always one better. So somehow I could have, maybe, but at least you are so careful to, to really take the right image. So average quality is better. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you cannot really experiment in a creative way. You know, I, I have uh, photographed since I, 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 I use digital in Tibet with galloping horses. Uh, you know, you have to take oh, flying birds. You know, if, in front of my hermitage, there's this, those, this uh, beautiful Himalayan magpie, so colorful that come every morning. And it's funny because they always come in the same direction. And I never see them coming back. So there's must be <laughs> an inexhaustible pool of magpies in one place going to the high Himalaya. <laughs> Anyway, I photographed them, but imagine photographing a flying magpie with a 300 millimeters. So no, nine, 20 photos, you're lucky if one magpie is in the frame. You get a, a half of a tail or something. So I have some fantastic photos of a few of them, but with film, I would have given up. I would not even try. What a waste, you know? But then you can play like that. And horse race, you can take many, and suddenly this is magic moment with two horses that look like twins. And so anyway, those things, I think, allows you to, I think, somehow, yes, come out with 
better images in the end. And portraits, you'll be amazed how if you take many, many like that, there's one, there's something so much more of the presence of the brightness in the eye, and the two or three before and three or three after is just not the same. So it's, you can't, you know, the idea of you get exactly the right moment is, doesn't work because it's so fast and your reaction is not that fast. So it's luck. Thank you very much.